tonight's annual training on Oregon ethics and public meeting law key issues for public officials. Uh, Mike Porter is here from Miller, Nash, Graham and Dunn to provide our training. And thank you, Mr. Porter, for being here. Thank you. Uh, it's nice to see everyone this evening, those, those who we can see. Uh, who didn't uh, run into the Zoom issues. Uh, very, very nice to, to be with this group tonight and following up last year's session on ethics, which we'll cover a little bit tonight, uh, was asked to look at best practices for uh, public meetings law as well as Oregon ethics law. And uh, as this board has discussed and addressed before, we uh it's it's a best practice to look at best practices over using that term especially as those laws relate to transparency as they relate to the public trust and so like we did in december uh a year over a year ago uh with oregon ethics law we'll do a refresh on that as i mentioned we also did that with a uh, number of administrators and staff after the board session. So the board may have been aware of that at the time, but sometime in late January or February, uh, ethics issues were addressed with staff that are most likely to run into issues there. Um, but I was asked to start with public meetings law. I should give the obligatory disclaimer, which is, on any issue uh, under the statutes, regulations, and guidance, there's always a risk that you can get really into the weeds. Uh, you could do sometimes a half an hour or an hour on, on a pretty minute piece. And so this session by its nature will be more about identifying issues, some of the key issues, practices, and way to think about how to manage through those. So if we can move to the next slide. Um, Often in uh, these sessions, uh, maybe a, it's the same old refrain, but if it is, so be it. And that refrain is, hey, let's remember what is the purpose of this law? Because often when we get into those weeds and there's something where there might not be a clear answer, keeping the purpose of the law in mind can be a, a helpful guide, a barometer of where that decision is going to land. And so Oregon's public meetings law, like the ethics law, has a statement on policy the Oregon form of government requires an informed public aware of the deliberations and decisions of governing bodies and the information upon which decisions were made. It is the intent of the public meetings law that decisions of governing bo bodies be arrived at openly. And the courts will address nuances in the law by referring to the policy and say, when in doubt, Oregon favors the openness of governmental functions. Now, of course, there are going to be times where there are other compelling policies that bump into the openness. So you could have a personal privacy uh, situation where those interests have to be balanced and you have to evaluate the statutes, but the executive session uh, exceptions that we'll talk about, those address a lot of those areas. Um, but when we're talking about public meetings, this is the policy and it's our, it's our guiding star, so to speak. So moving on to the next slide, I wanted to put out front a resource that some of you are probably familiar with, but perhaps not everyone, and that is the Oregon Attorney General's Public Records and Meetings Manual. Uh, it's linked through this document, if, if that was sent to you, but it's easily found through a Google search for that, uh, for that document. And it's, it's really a nice outline with uh, discussions in plain English about the scope of the meetings law, about the mechanics of the meetings law. Uh, it's got a nice table of contents, so usually pretty easy to find what you're looking for. And if you, as a public official, are in a situation where you're wrestling with something, you want to know how to ask the question or what questions to ask, it's definitely a resource to consider consulting. So we'll cover 
three areas, three primary areas tonight uh, because uh, you know time is limited to some degree. And again, you can get into the weeds a bit on some of these, and there will probably be some some hypotheticals and questions that we can talk about. Uh, and those areas are. Uh, what do we mean when we're talking about meetings and to meet? And we're going to talk about enforcement and executive session challenges because there are some unique aspects to enforcement that apply specifically to individuals in, who, who have public roles and who are on uh, boards or uh, entities or committees that are subject to the public meetings rules. So, Let's move forward, and our next slide addresses what's really been the topic du jour for public meetings law since about 2015, when a Court of Appeals case came out addressing the issue of uh, when is there a meeting, what is to meet? And that's because, uh, the basics are easy, okay? A standard board meeting with an agenda, it's a public meeting. And a board is required to have its meetings in public if they are having a public meeting. There is also a prohibition. So there's a mandate. The mandate is uh, public bodies uh, must meet in public session, but there's a mandate and that is that a quorum may not meet. So it's a violation of the public meetings law for a quorum to meet. And if you are fascinated by the language differences between the word meeting and meet, there are uh, many pages of an Oregon Court of Appeals opinion uh, describing the nuances of that language. But what it ultimately came down to was that with respect to the prohibition, serial communications, in other words, sequence of communications uh, that follow each other can result in a quorum meeting uh, and if, if those communications are for the purpose of deliberation or decision making on a matter that would come before the board. Now, uh, it, it's a difficult situation uh, and the facts of the case, uh, I won't get too deep into them, but they can be helpful to understand what was going on. Uh, the there was a question as to whether how a board was going to respond to a public records issue. And there were a couple of emails between less than a quorum of the board. And then there was allegedly a phone call to another member of the board that would have made it a quorum. And so uh, the plaintiff, another board member brought a claim and asserted that effectively this quorum met and violated the prohibition of the public meetings law. And the court said, even though uh, no single email, no single phone call involved a quorum, there could be a public meetings violation. And it described the determinative factors as being a sufficient number of officials involved what they discuss and the purpose is what matters, not the time, place, or manner of those communications. Now, I think you could come up with extreme hypotheticals where the time, for example, could not result in a violation. So if, if a board members speak in January of 2021, about something, and again, in March of 2022, it's going to be hard to claim that that was uh, the type of meeting that could, that that results in a meeting that would violate the prohibition. I, I try to think of it as, is there something on the agenda that's, or on, on the docket, so to speak, uh, which I use colloquially, that's coming up in front of the board that's a matter that concerns the board that's being discussed uh, by a quorum, and that can run you afoul of the public uh, 
meetings law. There are some practical implications um, of avoiding reply to all because you're getting a quorum and the discussion starts, uh, especially if it's on a substantive matter. Uh, it does need to be something that would ultimately be deliberated or come before the board. So if you reply to all on whether you would prefer the vegetarian option, you're not going to run afoul of the uh, public meetings law. Uh, but you start getting uh, into questions about who a contract who's going to be a contractor on a certain project, uh, curriculum decisions that are likely to be in front of the board, you, you can run into problems. Uh, beware the accidental quorum. This is really the lesson from the Handy versus Lane County case. Uh, it's the, the, the game of telephone. And you didn't mean for that board member to talk to another board member who talked to another board member all in the course of a day or two. And suddenly it's a violation of the public meetings law. So you're sort of constantly trying to thoughtfully assess what might become a board decision and how you communicate with this. The, uh, one of the defenses that was raised in the Handy case was, this is really nuanced and hard and how should board members they shouldn't have to deal with things like this. And the, uh, the court said, well, the attorney general's public meetings manual has lots of things that are nuanced and challenging, and we think that board members can figure it out. It also equated the situation to a social event in which there's a quorum of the board and said, at a social event, Board members have to be aware of what it is that they're talking about unless they want to call a public meeting if a quorum is going to be there. And so um, I, that's, that was the line the court drew. And so they didn't care that this is difficult and uh, does have ambiguities. I went to, to school uh, in South Carolina, at the University of South Carolina for a while, and they noticed all of the football games as a public meeting uh, for their Board of Regents because they knew they were going to be talking about business up there in, in their suites. And so, you know, are you doing the public's business? Uh, and if so, you just keep that policy in mind and be really thoughtful about where your communications are. So, hey, Mike. Yes, please. This is, this is Andrew. Um, I, I was just curious. I remember when I when I read this decision, it's been a little while. Um, it really was sort of based on the language of the statute and and sort of the implications. And I mean, the reality, and you've described it pretty well, the appeals court ruling pretty much outlawed what most governments in Oregon do, right? So elected officials talk to one another and, and they talk to one another in one-on-one -on -one situations, sometimes two-on-one -on -one situations. Um, is that case still active? Because it was an appeals court decision, so I wasn't sure if it got appealed to the Supreme Court. And has the legislature considered or taken any action to change? Because again, as I'm remembering, I think it was I think it was Judge Garrett sort of you know was was saying, look, this is really what the plain reading means. The the, the, the practical implications are not his job as a judge, right? So the general um, approach is that if this is the representation of the law as it stands. It was appealed to the Oregon Supreme Court who effective, which effectively punted on the decision of serial communications. And then there's another TriMet case that alludes to serial communications somewhat endorses at least the concept. Um, I am not sure if there has been a legislative activity to address it. I thought about that uh, to, today, uh, just gosh, it'd be nice to get some efforts in this area and uh, haven't been made specifically aware of any. Of course, the challenge of making efforts in this area is sometimes the politics of it can be, well, people are trying to shut down work that uh, they're trying to avoid the policy of the public meetings law. So, but uh, I think there probably are some compromises. It is something that if I were a board member and thinking about legislative agendas, is it something that, that ought to be part of one? Because of course we have the policy of the open meetings and then we also have the realities of getting the work of entities done and to the extent this can, can create a barrier or chill helpful conversation, uh, that's a challenge. So. Did I get basically to your question? Tree? Yes, yes. I, I thought that was probably the answer, which is yeah. not a great answer, but it, it is the answer. So thanks. Yeah. 
that's uh, so, sometimes I feel like that's my life, but uh, you need to tr- for the moment treat this as the operative operative law. Let's let's move to a topic that I think there's a relationship here, and that's the public body issue. What are the public bodies that are subject to this law? So, in other words, we it's for the board members. We're the board. We understand this going in, but the public body question uh, flows from this question of quorums and meetings because a public body, aside from being specifically districts, counties, cities, it's uh, a, a body that has the authority to make decisions for a public body on policy or administration, or that has the recommendation Uh, ability to make a recommendation to that body, such as a commission, committee, subcommittee, or advisory group. And so you can see that it brings in a swath of uh, entities, particularly in larger sophisticated entities that are going to need, uh, you know, other specific committees doing doing investigative work, reporting back to the board, uh, those end up being public bodies and are subject to the notice provisions and the other provisions that that we are talking about and will talk about. The the easiest distinction is if it's reporting to a administrator, if this committee is reporting to an administrator, for the administrator to make a decision, then it is not a public body. If it is reporting to the administrator for the administrator to decide what to recommend to the public body, then you're going to get into the public body territory. Um, While I just uh, had a little power blank where I am and I hope it is just, (laughs) if I go dark, Hopefully, uh, it will be very brief. Uh, so, but, so Mike, um, yeah. this is Director Constam. So, on your last point, um, reminds me of the ruckus that we got into with regard to that uh, that advisory committee on enrollment and transfer um, a while back, like probably six, seven, eight years ago, which um, led to that distinction between. Uh, advisory to a public body or advisory to a superintendent or advisory to the superintendent who is advising to the public body. So did we get any more clarity out of that um, episode? I I think so, because I think that that recited what, where the attorney general comes down on this question uh, in the guidance it's it's consistent with that and what one would anticipate a court interpreting this language uh where it would come down so i think that was a a clarifying moment uh that fits within the discussion that, that we're having right now so so we're kind of in the process of taking inventory of our citizens of our um public committees. So Roseanne, just a note for us that this is something that we should flag on each of those. Um, Most of them don't have charters, but if we create charters or those that do have charters, let's make sure this is crystal clear. Um, To whom are they they responsible for advising? And and it can get a little more uh, complex than that. That's a piece of it. There's a, the courts set out six factors. So the entity's origin, the nature and function of the body that is assigned and what's performed, scope of authority granted, nature and level of governmental, financial, and non-financial support, uh, scope of the government control over the entity, uh, and the status of the entity's office officers and employees. So I, I do think that what we spoke about, Director Consum, is the is a nice, it's a clearer than multi-factor weighing. It's a clearer way to find some distinctions there. Um, but ultimately, there probably are go- always going to be some groups that are at the margins. And so 
those are um, those are the factors that are evaluated when assessing those that are at the margins. So when for, so to your point, the reason to make those assessments is because you're going to have uh, the uh, requirements of the public meetings law. So those are the mechanical requirements of notice, note, make, creating proper notice. Uh, place, there are statutes about where the meeting can and cannot be. But also, if we move to the, that segues into the next topic, probably the more challenging issues, and those are the executive session challenges. And so there are permitted executive sessions held outside of the public's view. Uh, there are a few that are, are very narrow. Um, so it's 12 general executive session purposes and then some that are very narrow. So for example, to consider student uh, expulsion only applicable to school districts and uh, fairly straightforward. Um, the other 12 that are broadly applicable, as you might imagine, have um, they have their, their ins and outs. Uh, among those are legal counsel, labor negotiations, discipline of a public employee. And so the, you have the notice issues, hopefully somebody is tracking those and those get pretty detailed and I think are beyond the scope of, of this session. But the issue is what can happen frequently within those executive sessions and what is the scope of those executive sessions. And the when you're in an executive session, it's good to look at the attorney general's manual or have somebody who is looking at that because the scope is described of each of the different uh, kinds. You are allowed in those executive sessions to engage in preliminary consensus or in, informal decision making, but the actual decision has to if there is a decision to be made, it has to be made outside of the executive session. So of course I'm involved in attorney-client privilege fairly frequently. And in those we often seek and properly obtain a consensus view based on questions and information related to the claim of, you know, here's an aggressive approach, here's a less aggressive approach. What I'm hearing from the board is, this is the direction I'm going to try to go. Those, those are proper, but here's the settlement agreement. Do you approve, approve it or not? You can have discussions in the executive session about it, but when you say it's approved or it's not approved, it comes out into a public session and you break into a public session for it. Um, and then the scope, there, the, there are quite a few decisions. We'll talk about how the Oregon Ethics Commission does address the um, potential violations here, but there are quite a few decisions that relate to the scope where often it's a board member suggests that another board member exceeded the scope of the executive session. So if you're talking about dismissal of a public employee and suddenly it sounds like there's a full-on debate on whether the department that the public employee was the leader of uh, should have been restructured years ago and let's start designating somebody to make a plan to restructure this department there should be a, a flag that's going off does this really relate to the discipline or dismissal of this public employee um, and so I, again there yes um, this is Julia. Um, question about that. So the scope is set out when at the beginning of the meeting, it says we're meeting an executive session under ORS, whatever it is. Is that is that where the scope is set? Yes, that's where the scope. There are certain types under those statutes. So they're usually referring to a specific executive session and it needs to stay within the scope. Occasionally I've seen where multiple statutes may apply, which could affect the scope. Yeah, I mean, this is just like a commentary, I guess, um, maybe for our, our future practice is, while that's read at the beginning of the meeting, it's an ORS. And for most of us who aren't lawyers, it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, I mean, it, it's a generic, we know generally what they're there for. Um, is there 
I mean, you actually could take the ORS and translate it into like a specific scope? Yes. In fact, the uh, Attorney General manual is pretty good for that. And so it's something where uh, someone who is familiar with and deals with executive sessions a lot could set a reminder of this is what we're allowed to discuss. And if you're if we're not, if I always say you should be able to answer, uh, how is this connected to the topic that we're permitted to be in executive session for? And if you're having to pause too long, then you, you're probably pushing the envelope. Um, and so having somebody who, you know, you, your PPS is fortunate because you've got an in-house counsel who comes to uh, your meetings and ha has an eye on that. But for smaller entities, you know, I, I guess, who don't have somebody there, it's a, it's a refrain that I'm constantly bringing up. You know, now we're talking about something different, so we're here to talk about this. But using the Attorney General's manual or getting some information out before going into an executive session can be helpful. Sometimes it's gonna be obvious, but sometimes less so. Thank you. So, uh, and, and really that was to my final point is, I think you have to have an ear out and board members uh, and good healthy board are gonna hold each other accountable to this when they hear it. Um, and, you know, just raise the question uh, and that can be done in a non-accusatory way. Hey, is this within the scope of what we're permitted to talk about? Might very well be uh, because, you know, labor, Dealing with labor negotiations, if you're talking about a comprehensive collective bargaining agreement or all the negotiations going on now, I mean, the, the, the reach, the tether is long. And so uh, that, that certainly, um, you know, there can be an answer. Yes, I do think this relates to it. Uh, and hopefully you get someone who's pretty attuned to these providing some guidance. So we, one... we generally don't have the opportunity to ask that of one another since Liz has a hair trigger on this stuff. Well, that's good. Uh, so keep somebody with a hair trigger on this stuff around and uh, you'll, you'll be in good shape. And that's, I feel like we set up segues into the next slide because Director Constam, that raises why do you want somebody with a hair trigger around? Well, because this is on the public official. And so the Oregon Government Ethics Commission uh, investigates these claims against public officials. But the, the, what they investigate is violations of the executive um, of executive session. So that's what OEGC investigates. Uh, courts, so unlike public records, which involves the DA before the courts, courts uh, handle the other issues. And if a court finds a willful violation of an executive session, it can require the individual public official to pay the attorney's fees of the party who brought the claim. So it, obviously we want to presume everyone's acting in good faith and not going to ha engage in willful misconduct. Uh, but but that's why we have somebody with the hair trigger to make sure we don't even get close to uh, get close to that. Uh, so it is something to individually be aware of uh, as you go through looking at the, the bodies and evaluating whether or not they're public bodies, getting this information out to to them or having somebody who's got got a hotline to the, the legal counsel office for these types of questions is, uh, you know, potentially going to save them. And obviously it's the entity's problem too, if an individual is having challenges. So I want to stop there. We anticipated that this, that the exec or that the public meetings session would take most of the time. And we were talking 30 to 45 minutes and the other is such a refresh. Let me stop there, see if there are questions there. Um, and if not, I'm just going to remind you of the kind of the three main rules and, um, three main rules in the Oregon ethics law, uh, just so that they're in your mind and you know when to raise those. So Mike, this is a BAC member D. Loretto. Um, one of the issues in my past life was, and particularly has become more troublesome now because we don't meet together is this notion of what can occur with by uh, discussion over emails. And so where one person starts sending an email to another, 
regarding whatever the item is that you're either recommending or you're approving. Now, I used to tell my elected officials you couldn't do that. Can you just for a minute talk to us about emails and discussions that may or may not occur? Sure. So the first point I'll make about emails relates generally, uh, ex whether it's regarding public meetings law or not, is emails uh, often are subject to interpretation in any dispute. And so you ought to take great care in writing them. And the same goes for text messages and other types of communication. Uh, with respect to members of a public body, if the email discussion turns into basically a quorum providing comments about the information, then you run into that problem that is described in the Lane County case, uh, Handy versus Lane County. So it's something to be uh, it's something to be attuned to. And if we go all the way back to the purpose is Gosh, that's frustrating. I wish we could have freer conversation by email. Understand that. And right now what the courts are telling us is that you, you need to call a noticed meeting and have your discussion that way to fulfill the purpose of the public meetings law. Anything else? All right, well, you know how to get uh, to, to get a hold of, of Liz and Liz knows how to get a hold of us and others who can help through these issues as, as they come up. And it sounds like there's some good work going on in that, uh, in the area of assessing the various bodies out there that may be subject to these laws. So, uh, I don't want to just rehash the entire uh, Oregon ethics law session from last year. And so maybe I'll just go five to eight minutes with some quick reminders um, if we move into that second set. And again, this will be very brief. Uh, my refrain, go back to that policy. Public official service is a public trust and people require public officials to uh, be ever conscious of the public trust. There was a, a link between the executive session discussion and the Oregon ethics law that I wanted to make here. And that is uh, we didn't speak last year uh, in any significant manner about volunteers, but volunteers can be subject to the Oregon ethics law. And the, while the analysis is not precisely the same. You can imagine that the more significant the role of the committee, the, the more engaged it is in the, in particularly financial decisions that might be made by the district, uh, the more likely it may be that a volunteer falls under the ambit of a public official and needs to be thoughtful uh, about the principles. So just, Quickly, if moving on, I will uh, recommend in the next slide the Oregon Ethics Commission has a guide for public officials that addresses the three primary topics, uh, use of office, gifts, and the multitude of gift uh, exceptions. And finally, conflicts of interest and how those are dealt with. So I'll just touch on those standards as a reminder. And if we move forward, that general rule comes up in the next slide. And that is a public official may not use or attempt to use their position to obtain financial gain or avoid financial detriment, as you'll recall it it's a broad swath of people that it applies to and questions come up if you're an employee agent uh, owner of a business then that can be encompassed within the prohibitions from using official positions uh, to obtain financial gain or avoid de detriment so let's just quickly go through the 
a couple of the other slides. There are a number of exceptions if we look at even using your office. There are um, honorariums can apply to board members. The one that I, I would be attuned to as a board member is the relation to a private business. So if I'm receiving a professor of the year award completely separate from the work that I do for PPS and uh, the and I obtain some honorarium for that, uh, it's, it's not going to be a violation of the law. Reimbursement of expenses, I point out uh, that you, you have policies and processes and following those will uh, spare potential uh, problems in this area. And quickly, the next slide, we address some of the examples. These come up more with employees. Um, but not, not exclusively, but the things you hear about the most are some of the freebies that show up. Um, you know, uh, I was thinking, if, if you are thinking being on this public board is great, I had no idea there were so many perks, then you, you might want to stop and think because that's not what's associated with uh, the, you know, if there are a lot of perks, you really should have a little red flag of, are these perks gonna run me afoul of any of those prohibitions that we talk about about once a year? Um, and so moving forward, we have our uh, gift prohibition is on the next slide. That's the $50 rule uh, point I thought I'd emphasize this year that I did not emphasize last year is that a, entity with a legislative or administrative interest in the work of a public official, it can have its, um, its individuals can be linked together. So it's like imputed. So in other words, if you have multiple people from the same company that are um, keeping under $50, but it overall exceeds $50, then you can run afoul of the gift prohibition. So I will say since I've practiced a lot more public officials have just gone to, I'm not taking, I, I, I will pay for my coffee. I will pay for my sandwich. It's just simpler that way. Uh, if not, you know, think about a system for tracking it so that you don't uh, run into trouble. Um, end up being an example somewhere. There are a lot of exceptions to the gift rule that are uh, in the, the next, not all of them are in the next slide. Those that come up uh, with some regularity are if we advance, if we can advance the slide. And uh, this year, there, the issue of Representing the public body at a dinner uh, has been certainly less frequent, but that'll start coming up again, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, and uh, the unsolicited token or award, I would like to lay claim to the standard that I thought of on the spot December 19th last year, and that was if you can re-gift it, it might make you wonder whether or not you've exceeded the unsolicited token or award for less than $25 uh, exception to the gift prohibition. One more topic that uh, just to close out and again, just a refresher or reminder of the conflicts of interest, which is our last uh, slide before the enforcement slides. And so the conflicts of interest, uh, there are the questions of the potential action or decision when it might be to the private benefit of a prohibited to either the public official or someone who falls into the, the other categories of relative, uh, or whether you have an actual conflict where it's clear it's going to result in a pecuniary benefit. And the rule on those is in the next slide always have to declare the conflict of interest. If it's a potential conflict of interest, you may participate in the decision making. Uh, you may not participate in the actual, uh, if it is an actual conflict, unless there's a necessity like to um, uh, 
have a quorum. And I got asked a question last year if, if uh, that was in the statute, and I didn't know on the spot. Uh, and it is in the it is in the statute, not just the regulations. That necessity rule uh, wouldn't expect it too often to come up. Uh, with uh, PPS more likely to come up with smaller boards that have a hard time getting a quorum. And then finally, just a, a reminder, if you have particular sticky questions, there are official opinions that can bind the Oregon Ethics Commission. So uh, they can create a free and clear, but they take uh, quite a number of months to get processed, or you can get a less formal staff opinion. And if your facts track the stack staff opinion and the issue later arises, the uh, consequences will not be a monetary fine. They will be more educational in nature if you were in good faith relying on a staff opinion. Uh, and the penalties here can be severe, $5,000. And uh, if there's a significant financial benefit, it can be doubled as a fine against a public official. So that was obviously a quick trip through because we've done that topic more recently. Uh, but obviously, I'm happy to take final questions on either topic. Uh, exceeded my allotted time. I apologize for that. I think one of the issues for us, Mike, is that we have Liz, and so we're so used to being able to call on her for guidance or have her there reminding us. Um, and I, I was very proud of us when we were at Harvard all together that you know we were very clear. Okay, we can we can talk about birth order and pets and things like that when we're at lunch, but we cannot talk about you know anything that relates to the business of the school board. But we can get to know one another better. Well. I equate it to we, we get events with judges and you can't go in and say, geez, judge, we've been waiting on your ruling for a long time. You got any information? There's plenty of other things to talk about. The one thing I, I do want to point out is I don't want to be so restrictive to not allow a free and uh, you know robust discussion in the executive session. And you do have Liz there who's keeping an eye on those things. Um, but But you are allowed to you know, make sure you understand what's going on in the executive session. And uh, I know as a person who's answered questions in executive session um, frequently, actually not frequently, but I am always comfortable to say, uh, I think that's probably within the scope and something else we're starting to get away from it. Um, but uh, if, if scope issues need to be sorted out, you do have Liz there. And then your challenge is probably if you, if you end up with executive sessions of some of the other um, uh, committees and such. They're probably less likely to have executive sessions just in practice as I think out loud about it. Um, but if, they, if there would be a reason for them too, I think you wanna have somebody available who's attuned to where those issues are. Well, I look forward to being back in BSC and uh, get, getting real vibes instead of uh, read through the Zoom vibes, but I uh, appreciate it being here. And uh, um, obviously, you know how to uh, reach out through Liz uh, to the extent this prompted any questions. Thanks so much, Thank you. Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Liz, is there anything else this evening? Uh, or is this, can we adjourn this session and move over to our legal? Uh, yes, so we can move to the next meeting. Um, it is noticed, I don't recall, Roseanne, if it's noticed for seven o'clock or immediately following this one, but it might be good for a little it is stand seven up break. It's seven o'clock. So we should start that one at seven o'clock and people can stretch their legs and let the dog out. <laughs> Sounds great. All right. So this, uh, Training session is adjourned and we'll see y'all back at seven for our um, executive session or those who are at the executive session, not everybody. So, hey, do we have to leave this session? Yes. Yeah.